welcome back to Savage Kitchen. Today, we are gonna be putting together a charcuterie board. I know often I do cocktails, but you can't just drink. You should have a little nosh with your cocktails. So today is about the perfect nosh. To me, uh, that's a meat and cheese board. So we're gonna talk about the elements of a charcuterie board, uh, the different categories you wanna be thinking about, and then how to actually assemble a charcuterie board. There's simultaneously a lot to it, and it's not rocket science. This really is about combining different flavors, exploring different tastes, uh, and having fun entertaining a group. And also, like, don't be shy about making charcuterie for yourself. I do it all the time. So the term charcuterie actually comes from a French word, and charcuterie was about uh, elevated and processed meats, usually pork, uh, from your butcher that were for specific purposes. Over the years and throughout different cultures, charcuterie has evolved into what we know now as a charcuterie board, which is usually filled with meats and cheeses, dried fruits, jams, honeys, all kinds of accoutrement. Um, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is what to put your charcuterie on. Usually it's a board. There are so many options for boards. You could use a cutting board like I have in front of me. Depending on how large of a group you're entertaining or if you're just entertaining yourself, that really is gonna determine the size of your board. You could use slate, you could use wood, you could use salt blocks. Interesting note about salt blocks, it, whatever you put on the surface of a salt block, it's going to add salt to the flavor of that food. Just keep that in mind. So make sure whatever surface you're putting your board down on uh, is sturdy enough and can support the board. And then if people need to get around it from all sides, you want it to be large enough. Um, and also don't be shy about using more than one thing. Let's say you're hosting a huge party, but you don't have a huge board. Use a couple different things and maybe you can categorize things by like just cheeses or just meats or just fruit. If you have a lot of section eaters, they don't like their food to touch. That's how you solve that problem. So one of my favorite uh, tips when it comes to buying cheese for a charcuterie board is to maybe avoid the giant one pound block of cheese and look for the cheese ends in the bin. So if you go to your grocery store, usually there's a, a cheese section, right? And often you'll find that the cheesemonger, that's actually a job and it's super cool, um, will take the small ends or odd sizes and put them in a sale bin. Uh, because they're not standard to everything else. This is the way that I personally have tasted a lot of amazing cheeses. So for example, I just bought this rosemary and olive oil Asiago. I might hate this. I'd be pretty annoyed if I spent 20 bucks on like a big pound of it, but to spend $3 on the small slice, absolutely perfect. This is gonna go great on a cheese board. As far as selection goes when you're putting together a charcuterie board, I recommend three cheeses, something that is soft and bloomy, something that is hard and a little bit sharp, and then something that's sort of middle of the road. Uh, in general, you could be really safe with like a Stilton for a crumbly middle of the road cheese. You could do a Pecorino or a Parmesan or a Gouda, a Mimolette's really good for a hard cheese. And then for a soft cheese, the classic is always Brie, Camembert is really good. Today, we're gonna try this Matika Cana de Cabra. Completely new to me. I was in the store though and I really liked how there's this outer and inner ring, different colors, and I know that there's gonna be different texture and different flavor with those. So we're gonna give this a try. You don't need to have meat on your meat and cheese board. It would just be a cheese board then. Um, personally, I have a deep love of cured pork. <laughs> so I chose a soporsada salami a uh, prosciutto de parma, and a cala, calabrese salami. Calabrese, calabrese, I could be screwing up the pronunciation of that. I'm really sorry. It also doesn't need to be pork product if you have a leftover prime rib that you wanna shave really thinly and include, or maybe chicken skewers. You can get creative with this. Smoked salmon is excellent on a charcuterie board. They're really, I'm gonna keep saying this, there are absolutely no rules when it comes to putting this together. Just choose things that you like and experiment pairing flavors together. All right, our next consideration for our charcuterie board are going to be those fun textures and flavors that we're pairing with our meat and cheese. This can be anything from dried fruits, dried apricots are a favorite of mine, 
to olives, to different nuts. Marcona almonds are always excellent. I often like to include a chocolate element on my cheese board. Um, and I also, <laughs> dark chocolate almonds are a personal vice of mine and they're fun to throw on a cheese board too. The point here is that we want to introduce some different textures from our cheeses and see how introducing different flavors is going to pair with our cheeses. Okay, life's really in the sauce. So technically these aren't sauces, they're spreads or jams, but I love a good fig spread on a cheese plate. Pepper jelly is another great choice. A really nice stone ground mustard is good. Think about this, uh, if you were building a cocktail, what is the acid element you would add to your drink? These are sort of that lane, right? So the final thing to consider for your charcuterie board is the vehicle, the cracker. This could be toast, this could be crackers, this could be your bare hands, no judgments. Um, but having a, a selection of different crispy things to serve your cheese on is really a lot of fun. And I just picked up these Artisan Crisps, apricot, pistachio, and brandy. They seem bougie and fun. Let's try them out. So to assemble our cheese board, first thing we're going to do is place the cheese. Now, uh, tips for starting your cheese board. You want to start with your cheese cold because we're going to make some cuts that are like suggestion cuts for people to know how they should cut each individual cheese. And it's better to do that while the cheese is cold. For serving, you're going to want to be serving it at room temperature. So start your charcuterie board a little bit early and let it sit out for, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour before you actually serve it. So for this, I'm just going to pick some spots that are kind of far away from each other. And I'm separating textures. I have my two soft cheeses opposite each other. And each of these cheeses is a little bit hard. Actually, this one is the hardest. We're gonna put this on the end. This one's a little bit softer. This one's like a medium soft. Personally, I like there to be a little bit of room on my charcuterie board because I like to see what I'm eating and have some room to cut. Um, there are beautiful charcuterie boards that you'll see all over Instagram where people fill every square inch with treats. It's totally a personal choice. I, however, I'm kind of serious about food, if you can't tell. So I really do like there to be like a little bit of room around things. I like to see what I'm eating and I kind of want to uh, make it less intimidating to people who are approaching the board. I don't want anybody to feel bad about removing something from it and trying it. So we're going to start with our Saint Angel or Saint Angel. I have no idea how you pronounce this, which is very Brie-esque. It looks like a bloomy rind cheese, very soft. Smells a little bit nutty, pretty psyched about that. This is a whiskey smoked Gouda, <laughs> which I tried once before and it's pretty damn good. Uh, this is that Rosemary Asiago. This is a North Sea cheese. I have absolutely no idea what this is. Uh, but like I was saying before, came in a small block. I'm nothing if not adventurous, so I wanna try it. And then this one that's staring back at us. Can't wait. Next thing we're gonna do is make those suggestion cuts. So each cheese sort of requires a different way of handling. So for example, a soft cheese, you're going to want to use something that you can spread with as a knife. A harder cheese, maybe you want to cut into sticks. So a knife like this is used for a crumbly cheese, like a Stilton. You want to stab the cheese and sort of twist it around and release some of those crumbles. A knife like this is perfect for something soft, like a brie or a camembert, because you can cut into the cheese and then spread on the cracker with the same knife. A knife like this is great for a hard cheese. Let's try this uh, North Sea cheese. See how it just kind of like slices down? Oh, it's so good. Mm -hmm, I'm gonna love this. Okay, so let's go about making some of those suggestion cuts. So you can see on the whiskey gouda too, this has a waxy rind uh, that you don't eat. Some cheeses, the rind is edible, some are not. Uh, and also sometimes it's personal preference. Some people don't like any rind, even if it's edible with their cheese. With this, I'm simply peeling back that rind a little bit as I'm cutting the cheese. And it releases naturally. You kind of know which ones are edible and not by whether or not the cheese just sort of naturally lets go.
right, so once we've got our cheeses sort of in place and some suggestion slices doled out, we're gonna add our meats to the board. We have our prosciutto, I have uh, our slight salami, and then I have a, what do you call this, a log, a whole salami? I have no idea. We're gonna treat this the same as the cheeses where I'm going to do some suggestion slices and then leave the rest of it whole because chances are, we're not gonna get through this whole thing in one sitting. I mean, maybe, it's been a long week, but chances are we're not gonna get through the whole thing. So I only wanna slice a little bit of it. So for our pre-sliced salami, I'm gonna just take these and fold them so they take up less real estate. So for prosciutto, it's notoriously um, hard to play with from a design aspect because it's so thin. So I actually like to just take these and kind of fold them into a little, I don't know, we'll call that a rose, sure. Uh, but the point is that it's like an individual serving. Also, if you think that your uh, prosciutto slices are too big, cut them in half. So if we're approaching this from a design perspective, odd numbers are always good. So I put, uh, I don't know, I think I did five, three big pieces and two little pieces over here. So I'm gonna do three pieces over here. Odd numbers when working with design are usually pleasing to the eye. As you can see, we're getting we're sort of like filling up here. So now I wanna start adding in some of these other textures and flavors. You can put things directly on the board or you can use little bowls if you want. For example, with the olives, I'm gonna put these in a little bowl because they're, they're in a brine and I don't want that brine to seep into my other things. So if you wanna separate a flavor, give it its own vessel. Okay, so now we're gonna go about adding our jams and jellies and mustards to the plates. I'm going to choose a really nice stone ground mustard. This um, is sort of a nice foil to a mild creamy cheese, adds a lot of brightness and zing to it. So I'm just gonna take a spoonful. You could also do a little bit of honey. That is one of my favorite things to pair with cheese, especially a nice sharp cheddar. It's really delicious with some honey. So one of the important things to keep in mind when putting this together is that you want everything to be easily accessible and easy for your guests to just sort of pick at. So if you're gonna put a sauce or a jam or a mustard, make sure you put some sort of implement so they can scoop it out. Uh, that's why we do the suggestion cuts. That's why we do folding of the meats. Everything should be uh, easy to pick at and easy to eat. So now we're just gonna fill in a little bit of the open space with some nuts. I really like these Marcona almonds. And this kind of creates a bridge between some of our cheeses. Then I'm gonna take some of our dark chocolate almonds. Let's see those over here. I'm gonna take some of our dried apricots. Apricot, apricot, tomato, tomato. So for crackers, one of the things that I like to do is actually have them in separate bowls. So I have these, uh, these crisps, these uh, apricot pistachio brandy crisps that sound amazing. And then these are just uh, cracked pepper flatbreads. So one of our final steps is if you want to label your cheeses, I would do that now. I have these handy little uh, cheese slates that I got at uh, Crate and Barrel because I'm obsessed. And uh, these are fun because you can just write on these, they're reusable, stick them in your cheese and then describe what the cheese is. So for example, this is a uh, whiskey aged Gouda. So I'm gonna put that right on this. Perfect. So finally, you might be wondering what to do with all this cheese if you don't eat it all. And uh, there's a couple tricks to storage. One, eat the cheese. Cheese doesn't last forever. Make your heart happy, eat the cheese. But two, uh, if you've overdone it and you do need to refrigerate your cheese afterwards, simply use a piece of parchment paper or wax paper or even uh, Murray's Cheese sells cheese bags you don't wanna store these in plastic because the plastic promotes uh, bacteria growth and mold and it won't last as long. So if you store these in a little piece of parchment paper, they'll last much longer in your fridge. 
And there we have it. Easy principles to stick by for a cheese board. Experiment with this, have fun, try the odd sounding cheese. Um, at the end of the day, it's only like a $4 commitment. You're gonna be fine. And uh, let me know how it goes. See you in the comments. Cheers, friends.